thank you very much, uh, Professor McNeil, uh, for the invitation, and also thank you for the Cornell East Asian program. Um, as Professor McNeil said, my primary uh, field of study is early China. But over the years, I also developed the secondary field in the history of heritage conservation in, uh, in modern China. Uh, after I finished my uh, coursework at UCLA, I worked as a graduate intern at the Gedi Conservation Institute. And at that time, the Gedi was helping the Chinese government to formulate a, a guideline uh, principles for the conservation of heritage site in China. For that project, I started my research um, on the history of heritage conservation in China. But I, originally, I'm also interested in, in the dis, a disciplinary history, history of archaeology, history of museum study, you know, these kind of things in, in China. So it's a very good um, uh, combination of these um, interest in, in the intellectual history of China to put them together. So I look at the heritage conservation. It's not the technical aspect. It's more the policy, the intellectual aspect of heritage conservation. Three main questions for heritage conservation. So uh, what to preserve, how to preserve, or why to preserve? You know, these are three basic questions that in, in heritage conservation were asked. And this theoretically was uh, guided by the uh, value-based analysis. Um, in art history, um, the, the Austrian art historian Regal developed uh, John Ruskin, Ruskin's uh, concept of uh, voiceness into a systematic char characterization of uh, different values of a monument. He had very important essays in uh, 1908, the modern cult of monument. So for example, historic value, artistic value, age value, commemorative value, use value, newest value, or social value, or even um, monetary value, right? How, how expensive the, the, you know, the, um, the thing. So um, the talk I'm, I'll, I'll talk today is um, a, a part of a large project that I'm uh, working on right now. It's my second book project. And uh, um, so, this is, is my primary organization of my chapters. And my chapters is uh, chronologically um, 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 built and also uh, thematically, but uh, focus on the value. Um, so of, of course, um, in traditional China, China has a long history of uh, uh, antiquarianism, right? collecting things, collecting collectibles. But this didn't lead into um, a national policy um, preserve the material past. Only in the modern period, uh, basically the, uh, the um, new policy movement in the end of Qing Dynasty, they start to formulate um, national policies on how to preserve things. So all these collectibles, old sites, deserted uh, uh, monuments began to connect with the idea of a new nation. It's, it's part of a, a modern nation building uh, process. So I'll talk about the uh, education reform and the development of a public, public space, public sphere, and the introduction of a new cultural institution such as a museum, public museum, public library. These kind of public institution were introduced into China in the, begin, in the end of Qing Dynasty, and the introduction of new social values. Uh, so at this time when Chinese government elite uh, officials looking back at Chinese history. They re-evaluated Chinese history and, and um, came up with new values. So um, the next I will talk about the, the Western exploitation of Chinese antiquity and the public awareness of, of cultural heritage um, from, um, from late Qing Dynasty up to um, 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 the established People's Republic of China in, in 1949. Um, many of uh, uh, Chinese objects, antiquities, was, was um, smuggled or, or sometimes um, um, legitimately bought, purchased from China and um, now in, in the museum all over the world. So to react to, to react, the reaction to that, um, 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 removal of Chinese antiquities, the Chinese government uh, developed uh, laws 
measures per, to protect Chinese, Chinese uh, material past. And uh, the third chapter, I will talk about uh, public ownership and the fate of the imperial property. Uh, and then uh, the next one is the, uh, from archaeological um, heritage. In 1930s, um, China, uh, the, 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 the uh, nationalist government uh, um, formulated the first um, national law on protecting uh, Chinese antiquities. And they, they state about the uh, um, public ownership, national ownership of Chinese antiquities. And introduced the, exactly the uh, scientific value uh, into Chinese uh, heritage conservation. And then, uh, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, the destruction of, uh, of a cultural heritage. And um, after 1980s, the, uh, the economic reform, the open, open door again in China, and the, the uh, monetary value, the market value of Chinese heritage. And we, associated with that, the tomb robbery and, um, you know, the um, um, protecting of archaeological Heritage is a big issue in contemporary China. I came to Cornell, uh, Cornell also for the uh, purpose of using your um, rare books and manuscripts. Because in, 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 in here, their collection of uh, um, Friedrich McCormick's uh, family letter collection. McCormick is a journalist who went to China in the, uh, in the 1910s. And he reported, the, uh, this is uh, some of his book, he reported the, the, uh, Sino, uh, the uh, uh, Russian Japanese um, war in the beginning of, uh, of uh, 20th century. And he is, he's a China hand. He, uh, and some of his fa family paper is here. Uh, so uh, it was a very, very fruitful um, trip for me to um, work on this. So today I will focus on the, the, the notion of national heritage. So what do we call uh, cultural heritage or national heritage? These, these kind of things uh, was already, um, there are Chinese terminologies to, uh, to re refer to this. For example, traditionally in the later imperial China, we called uh, Gu Dong, probably antiques, right? And uh, Gu Wan curios, like during, especially in the Qing dynasty, in the Qianlong era, in the, in the 18th century, you began to develop um, domestic market of, of antiquity called, called Gu Wan. And uh, there's another name, the Gu Ji, or Ming Sun Gu Ji, in traditional Chinese logo gazetteers. In, in many Chinese logo gazetteers also, also have a section about the local the famous place and um, historical site or monuments in that category. And uh, uh, also Shi Ji, historical monuments uh, by Japanese scholars. When in the end of Qing Dynasty, Japan began to the a modernization process and Japanese scholars also visited China and 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 uh, uh, surveyed the Chinese monuments. They used the, used the words uh, uh, historical monuments. And Gu in 1930 law, the, you know, uh, ancient uh, relics. It's uh, our translation, but actually, the the connotation, the the um, the scope of uh, ancient relics, Gu is much much bigger. I will I will talk about later. And after 1949, general in mainland China used the words uh, wen wu, uh, cultural, cultural relics, uh, um, and also a uh, historically or culturally famed city, Li Si Wenhua Mingchen. And only in 1990s, Wenhua Yichan, cultural heritage, became popular in, uh, in Chinese um, writings. But although these this, uh, uh, terms came later, but this phenomenon started in the the end of Qing Dynasty. So I will go through, um, basically, you know, my talk, I will go through um, several major uh, legal documents on, on cultural heritage in modern China. The first one is in 1909, Measure for the Protection of Ancient Site, Baochun Gu Ji Tui Guang Ban Fa Zhang Chen. This is the earliest, first government document government legislation that I can find uh, regarding cultural heritage. And then there's a couple uh, um, uh, in 1930. For example, 1961, provision measures for the protection of ancient, ancient relics. 保存古物暂行, 暂行办法. 
this law particularly was um, was because um, Friedrich McCormick wrote a letter to um, to uh, Yuan Shikai, the president of Republic China, Republic China at that time, and urged the Chinese government to protect Chinese heritage. And I will, in my future research, I will do more uh, on this, this aspect. And another next most important one is the 1931 law on the protection of uh, ancient relics, Gu Wu Bao Chun Fa. It's um, by the nationalist government, the, the Kuomintang uh, government. And this basic legal structure was preserved uh, uh, even after the communist um, government. Uh, so uh, the 1982, the law of the People's Republic of China on protection of cultural relics, Wen Wu Bao Hu Fa. And the leader for, um, for um, that, that, take, that, that play a very important role in this, in formulating this law and some of these um, um, articles in this law is, is Xia Nai, the, the famous Chinese archaeologist. Um, uh, because at that time, already had economic reform. And some of the Chinese leaders want to uh, um, commercialize Chinese antiquity. And, and Xia Nai made all his effort to stop that. And uh, the, 19, the, the two, 2002 revision of the law is exactly undo the work Xia Nai did. So with the economic development, with the, the, uh, the opening of uh, many auction house and the private, private museums, and this is the current situation in China right now. So that's the, you know, the basic um, range I will cover. Um, so first is the, the education reform and the introduction of a new cultural institution and uh, new social values. So the military and cultural conflicts with the, with the West and Japan caused the Chinese to reevaluate their past at the end of Qing Dynasty. And under the internal and external pre pressure, the Qing government issued a decree calling for reform. So in September uh, 1905, the civil examination system was abolished. Uh, the Kuju Zidu civil examination system was abolished. And in December, a, minist a ministry of education, Xue Bu, was established uh, in China. So the education reform particularly challenged the role of Confucianism uh, in Chinese society. And eventually, Confucianism lost its significance as a state ideology and the basis of Chinese intellectual uh, ideology. The beginnings of the education reform and the expansion of a public uh, sphere and the formation of new elites in the end of Qing Dynasty provide a fertile background for the development of new ways of thinking about Chinese culture and history. New Western ideas and practice was introduced into China from different channels. Most importantly, reform-minded reform scholars like Kang Youwei, Liang Qicao, Yan Fu had written or translate many books to promote new Western political and social values. For example, the idea of a public park, public, public museums, and a public library, uh, the ex exposition culture. Like you, you have uh, periodically um, um, uh, uh, expositions in county level, in provincial level, national level, also uh, involved joined in the international expositions at that time. So these uh, new phenomena was introduced to China during this period. And in order to, wake, to awake the Chinese people, education and the new social institution was uh, advocated. The Qing government dispatched um, um, uh, the imperial court officials to study foreign affairs in, in the West and Japan. In 1909, a high official, and he himself also art collector, Duan Fang, led a group of Qing officials toward the United States and, and, and Europe. On the route, he visited many museums, and up, upon his return, he proposed to establish a, a public museum in China. Local officials, uh, such as Zhang, Zhang Jian, or uh, local entrepreneurs, uh, um, 
also um, uh, propose to set up institutions, institutions of exhibitions and combine the function of museum and, and library. The, the, the rise of a public consciousness and the process of introduction, new social value, continued and pushed to new and sometimes more radical, more, more, more radical levels during the new cultural movement in 1910s and 1920s. So this is one aspect of the, you, you began to have a new value system in Chinese, at least in Chinese elite uh, or, you know, and, and the government. Next aspect is the um, Western exploration, exploitation of, of Chinese antiquity and the public awareness of cultural heritage. At the same time, the Western exploitation and removal of art objects from China had provoked the public and the government's attention to its cultural heritage. The well-known example is the um, falling devils on the Silk Road, the cultural exploitation at Mogao Grottoes, Mogao Caves at Dunhuang, by Oro Stein in 1907, and shortly thereafter by Paul Palio in 1909, which was one of the trigger for the 1909 um, 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 document, legal document. Palio bought many, uh, purchased uh, uh, many Dunhuang manuscripts from the local uh, abbot uh, Wang Yuanlu. But uh, he shipped the majority of his material back to Paris. But he also carried some, some samples to Beijing. He actually, he first visited Duanfang. Then Duanfang introduced him to the scholars in Beijing, Luo Zunyu and a group of scholars in Beijing. So, uh, so uh, Paleo made a small exhibition of his game in Beijing. That shocked the Chinese scholars. Luo Zunyu and other Chinese scholars uh, motivated to um, urge the, the new ministry, uh, ministry of Education to urge the, um, uh, the governor of Gansu province to stop um, the, the looting and the, the selling of, uh, of uh, Dunhuang material and, uh, and um, uh, take them to um, uh, uh, Beijing. Uh, it is interesting to note that when the Ministry of Education used the administrative order to instruct the governor of Gansu uh, to protect the Dunhuang material, the ownership of Dunhuang manuscript was still not very clear. The manuscript uh, uh, was eventually purchased from this uh, Daoist abbot Wang Yuanlu at uh, 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 300 liang of silver uh, at that time. And Wang Yuanlu was, was very unhappy because actually Paleo paid him more. Paleo paid him five, five 500 liang of silver. Um, but most of the government funding was um, uh, embezzled in the process of, uh, uh, by the local officials. So that's the situation in China at that time caused the, um, the, the problem. So this um, uh, uh, removal of Chinese, Chinese um, antiquity from, from Chinese soil still continued until 1949. And here on, on, the, on the screen is Landon Warner, the famous uh, American art historian and Harvard professor of East Asian art. He was one of the inspiration for Indiana Jones. And he, uh, um, and one, one of the things he did in, in, um, in Dunhuang is he used a special chemical solutions to detach wall painting from the Buddhist cave. And now these, uh, these remain uh, in the, uh, Sacra Museum uh, uh, in Cambridge um, um, at, at Harvard. Particularly, it's uh, uh, Paleo's um, display of, of his um, the Dunhuang manuscript he got in Beijing that was uh, the one of important the trigger for this measure for the protection of ancient site in 1909, the same year that um, uh, Paleo um, arrived in Beijing. So this is not a, a coincidence that, that in 1990, in 1909, the newly established Ministry of Internal, Internal Affairs drew up measures for protection of ancient, ancient site. As the earliest government regulation related to the protection of ancient site, this is Qing government's effort to safeguard the cultural property in the name of the nation. In the preface, it's clearly stated that these measures were drawn in, in reaction to the 
to and try to stop the foreigners from buying any art treasures from China. There are four aspects of this uh, regulation that are worth noting. The first is uh, um, this, this, this regulation had a strong connection with the traditional practice of art collecting and the gazetteer writing. So it's a connection with the old Chinese practice. Secondly, it went beyond the categories of site and monuments that are often listed in local and national gazetteers and set up the framework for protection of secular, public monuments and art collections. In the traditional um, gazetteers, they often list uh, religious or um, um, more um, the, the, uh, monuments, temples related to local cults um, with religious uh, significance. But these documents, as, uh, as a modern nation, you need to also uh, protect um, secular and, and um, public, need to, or, or with no, no, no owner, you know, um, uh, um, um, and some property have no owners, but the government need to take care of them. Um, and also they urge the local officials to do surveys. And this practice actually continued in, 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 in contemporary China. China have a, a, a many of national uh, survey the cultural relics, uh, you know, to, to inventory um, the local um, uh, monuments. And third point is it, it's, it's recognized the historical artistic value, the two of the four values that was often ascribed to cultural heritage in modern China. And the last point is uh, this legal document appealed to international agreements for the protection of cultural heritage during the wartime that was developed in, in, in Europe. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, in Europe began to um, um, start an international uh, cultural heritage movement. Eventually, we end, uh, end up the, with, with uh, um, a UNESCO, uh, you know, um, 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 international cultural heritage uh, movement. So uh, it is clear that this 1909 uh, document marked a new beginning in the state protection of cultural heritage. The, uh, the third aspect is, uh, is the public ownership and the fate of international uh, imperial uh, property. The Qing Dynasty ended in 1911 with the abdication of uh, Abdication of the last Emperor Puyi. The impact of these events uh, would profoundly affect what constituted as the past. Uh, because as a modern nation, in the Chinese um, um, historical mind that, uh, uh, that constructed is uh, Qing Dynasty. Before Qing Dynasty, they considered ancient history. Right? So that's the past. So was the imperial dynasty gone, most former imperial palaces and sites become overgrown with weeds and littered with uh, refuse. How these properties should be uh, managed and who has the right to own and dispose, the, dispose them are the hot issue among not only the imperial household and the Qing, Qing officials, Qing loyalists, but also in the new uh, Republic government, official, officials, scholars, and common people. The most appalling uh, incidents uh, were the warlord Sun, Sun Dianying uh, dug up the, the Qing imperial uh, Qianlong and Cixi's tomb in the eastern Marceline near Zhenhua in Hebei province in May, May 19, 1928. So, Many warlords dug up Chinese anti and, and, and antiquities and sold in the inter international market to, um, to help them fi finance their military campaign. The situation is actually not much different from the you know, Taliban in, in Afghanistan, you know, now this kind of situation. So um, I, a couple years ago, I went to visit the, the site uh, where the um, how they opened the, the, the uh, Cixi and Qianlong's, Qianlong's tomb. So to the eminent scholar Wang Guowei, who had become an ultra-conservative, the controversies and dispute over the palace's, palace treasures was more than just the issue of property right. At that time, in 1920, uh, Wang Guowei was assisting the, in the inventory of the palace treasures, defending the last emperor's property right 
against a group of Beijing, Beijing University professors. He argued that on historical ground, that the imperial collection were accumulated by the emperors themselves. And also on legal ground, uh, I quote, every object in the imperial palaces under all the laws, ancient or modern, Chinese or foreign, is the private property of the imperial family. Wang accused his Be Beijing, Beijing University colleagues not only uh, ignore their legal duty as a citizen of the Republic of China, but also uh, ignore their uh, sacred duty as independent scholar and moral obligation as a human being. I quote, scholarship is certainly one of the highest enterprise of human race. But if without the support of moral and legal principles, it surely cannot stand alone. To, pro to protect ancient objects is only one goal of scholarship. But if, for the sake of preserving antiquities, one violates fundamental rights recognized in both laws and morality, both state and, soci both state and society will disintegrate. And where will, where will scholarship be, be then? One decidedly cut any relationship with, with Beijing University. To use the imperial uh, collection to, to shield, to, as a shield, uh, to protect the imperial family, Wang Guo submit a proposal to last emperor Puyi in May, in May um, um, 1924, and suggest that a section of the Forbidden City should open as a museum of the imperial household. It's a model on the, on the Japanese practice, Japanese imperial household museum. I quote, to display the ancient objects and the calligraphies and the paintings from the imperial household, let all the people, Chinese and foreign, has, have the opportunity to appreciate them. Thus, the Forbidden City will turn into a gathering of Chinese culture. We also forge an important connection to the world culture. In case, of, in case there are military affairs in the capital, all the countries will have the responsibility to, to protect it. So one could very much want to use the, use the imperial collection as a shield to protect the, 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 um, the uh, last emperor. But Wang um, uh, a suggestion certainly did not attract the attention of the young uh, last emperor. And five, five months later, the last emperor was expelled from the Forbidden City, and the palace treasures, except those was smuggled out by the last emperor, were inventoried and then become the buckle of uh, collection in the National Palace Museum. Uh, and the Palace Museum opened to the public. In, uh, in, 19, in October 10th, 1925. And now majority of these uh, imperial collection is in the National Palace Museum in, uh, in, in Taipei, um, uh, moved with the uh, national government in 1949. So during the uh, Republic period, an important figure in the modernization of the Beijing city and the protection of its culture heritage was Zhu Qiqian. Zhu was familiar with the Western style municipal administration and attempted to apply what he learned in the West to, to modern transformation of, of the city of Beijing. In November uh, uh, 19, 1914, the Institute for Exhibition of Ancient Relics, Gu Wu Chen Lie Suo, uh, was established in front of the Forbidden City, opened, opened its gate to the public. The institution set up to take over the imperial collection that was outside of Beijing, for example, because the, the, the Qing imperial palaces uh, in Chengde, in Shenyang, also have treasures. So they took all these treasures from, from Shenyang and Chengde and established this, um, um, the Institute for, for the Exhibition of, of, of Ancient Relics. This is the earliest um, um, government-sponsored museum in, in, in China. And the opening of this public museum have a great impact in the development of Chinese art. Because um, time, only at that time, ordinary you know, art student can just buy a ticket and go to this institute to view these all ancient, ancient uh, Chinese uh, masterpieces. Because otherwise, they are in the imperial collection. 
no one can access. So uh, this is a, a, a picture, uh, a, a Chinese uh, painting by a, a very famous uh, um, a Chinese painter and also art historian, Chen, Chen Shizhen. He's uh, the elder brother of Chen Yinchue, and a viewing painting in an exhibition in 1917. So, um, so this is the, uh, so, so this is the, um, um, uh, between the end of Qing Dynasty and the warlord period. Um, and now I'm talking about the, the, uh, the fourth aspect, the nationalism and the scientific value of archaeological heritage. The development of art market in the West and Japan for Chinese antiquities in the 19th century took a terrible toll on Chinese archaeological heritage. In addition, I, as I mentioned, the local warlord and tomb robber, encouraged by lucrative falling market, conduct clandestine excavations. After returning, after returning um, um, uh, China, uh, after the un unification of China uh, and moved the capital from Beijing to Nanjing in 1927, the nationalist government led by uh, Zhang Geishik started a vehement nation, nation building campaign. The surge of nationalism and the interplay with academic politics made the scholar, scholar politician such as uh, Fu Sinian, to use the new Western scientific archaeology to fight with both regionalism and imperialism. The Chinese government start to have tighter control of foreign expeditions and the removal of antiquity from China. And the legislation on cultural heritage develop, developed. In 1930, under the promotion of Fu Sinian, Li Ji, Dong Zhuobing, the nationalist government issued the Law on Protection of Cultural Relics, the Gu Bao Chun Fa, which clearly state all ancient objects underground or exposed on the surface are belong to the nation. And they established a registration system for the control of private collections and the lim limit the circulation and antiquity trade. This state ownership includes the right of excavation the right of grant license for excavation, which set a basic legal framework for the protection of archaeological heritage, uh, which is still at work in uh, People's Republic of China uh, even now. So from a historical uh, uh, perspective, in traditional China, the right of underground archaeological heritage was related to the land ownership. Since the Tang legal code, the Tang Li, Tang Li Su Yi, uh, in the uh, Chinese medieval period, and uh, sub uh, subsequently adopted by the Ming and Qing legal code. Object, if you find the object in your own land, you can own it. And if you find um, antiquities um, from other people's land, you need to uh, share with the, the, the landowner. But certainly they have, the, uh, you know, the government always reserve the right. If it's a significant, very important, the government can take it. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, the traditional legal, legal system. So it's the first time in Chinese legal history uh, the statement said, all ancient objects underground or exposed on the surface belong to the nation. So this is the, a very significant um, um, change. So this uh, 1930 law radically changed the traditional legal practice. It had become the main, main features of this law which not only clearly state the state ownership of archaeological heritage, but, but that I quote, these discovered, but did not, uh, those discovered, but do not report or attempt to hide the object will be treated as theft. If you find something, uh, antiquities, you didn't report to the government, to consider as a theft. So it's a very uh, severe, um, um, and regulation. Uh, another important feature of the 1930 law is a new scientific definition of the Gu Wu. Although Gu Wu is an old term, but this law um, um, gave it a new definition. The definition Gu Wu in this law referred to all the ancient objects related to archaeology, history, paleontology, and other branches of scientific studies. 
I, this is a quote from the, from the law. So one of the significance of the 1930 laws uh, connect the object of the past directly to modern disciplines introduced from the West. This scientific approach to uh, physical remain of the past reflect the new ways of uh, collecting data, the emphasis on the archaeological fieldwork, recording of the context where these objects found instead of just uh, seeking these treasures. Because at this time, all these uh, modern discipline, uh, archaeology, history, uh, paleontology, even, uh, even a study of, uh, of uh, um, um, past uh, plants, environments, and you know, all these new discipline was introduced in China. So this Gu Wu is anything could have scientific value is considered as Gu Wu. So it's a very broad uh, uh, definition. So the, the background of the 1930 law on the protection of ancient relics is the Anyang excavation that the newly established Institute of History and Philology of the Academia Sinica conducted in, at Anyang, Henan province, the last capital of the uh, Shang dynasty. Um, under the leadership of Fu Sinian and Li Ji, this ex excavation in the beginning was an international cooperation with the Freer Gallery in, um, in Washington, D.C. But the excavation was interrupted several times by the local um, local wars, local, local, local events. So because the local officials also want to stop, they, they claim you know, the national government does not have the right to own these Anyang excavated uh, treasures. The local government should, should want to, want to uh, have them. So Fu Sinian immediately began to look for ways to settle the, dis settle the dis dispute through political and legal channels. He campaigned for the national legislation on archaeological heritage. The result is this uh, 1930 law on protection of ancient, ancient relics. On the international level, the issue of ownership <clears throat> to archaeological heritage is also an a, a, a incentive for the, for the uh, agreement and dispute. Um, although it's not explicitly stated, the free galleries go for archaeological excavation in China was certainly to get new data and possibly get a new object from this secured archaeological context. So uh, uh, as associate curator of the free year from 19, 1922 to 1934, Carl Bishop led several archaeological uh, exhibition, in, in, ex exhibition in China. And early, early in last, early in 1920s, Bishop invited Li Ji, who had just returned from Harvard after a PhD degree in anthropology, to participate in archaeological cooperation. But Li Ji was sensitive to the issue of Western exploitation of Chinese cultural relics. He asked about Bishop about, about the uh, ownership of artifacts excavated in, in China. Bishop assured Li Ji that, I quote, you would not be asked to do anything which you might feel incompatible with your uh, allegiance to the Republic of China. So uh, a bishop uh, made, a, made a secret deal. Um, you know, Li Ji, I can work with you, but you don't need to worry about um, um, taking a check from China. I will do the job. But uh, Li Ji was satisfied with the answer in the beginning, though he did not miss the vagueness in bishop's uh, response. As the rise of national, national sentiment in China, the possibility for, uh, bene for, for benefiting anything from the ex cooperation uh, diminished. So the Free Gallery uh, withdraw from the Anya excavation in 1930 when the law was, um, was established. And um, this is um, uh, in the Free, in the paper, Carl Bishop paper in Free and Sackler uh, um, um, Gallery. Um, here I find a very interesting note by Landon Warner. So this is a, this, uh, a, a, private, a note Landon Warner uh, gave to Bishop. Said he just arrived uh, at Beijing and uh, I've just turned up and hope, I look forward to uh, hear, look forward to see you, right? And have all the gossips. <laughs> so, uh, so um, uh, Landon Warner and uh, uh, Carl Bishop is, is a group of, uh, of American um, 
archaeology in China um, um, try to um, 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 take removal, remove um, uh, Chinese object from, from, from China. So this uh, still here some of the uh, um, archaeologists in Anyang excavation, uh, Dong Zhuobing, Li Ji, uh, uh, Fu Sinian, and, and Liang Siyong. They all train, uh, except Dong Zhuobing, they all trained in the West and uh, brought all the Western um, archaeology, um, 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 uh, scientific new knowledge into China and, and used as, as a weapon, as a tool to against um, uh, imperialism and also regionalism. So uh, under this law, um, uh, Liang Siten and, and, and his wife Lin Huiying, in the 1930s, they started the, um, the, uh, the, the study of Chinese, um, a history of Chinese architecture um, in China. It's a part of the heritage uh, conservation. So although sharing uh, different political ideologies with the nationalist government, the communist government um, adopt this basic system uh, set up in 1930 law on the protection of cultural, cultural relics. The current, current legal framework is basically the elaboration uh, on this early system. The legal framework is, is quite uh, uh, defensive. Uh, it's emphasized the state ownership um, and it stretched the, the ownership and the control and the, the uh, and, and less clear about uh, management. So in, 19, in, 19, in 1991, so uh, after 1949, all archaeological uh, cooperation with, with outsider, with, with foreigner was stopped. Only in 1991, uh, the revision of the, uh, the regulation for foreign participation in archaeological work in China, they began to change. So uh, after 1991, um, Western uh, uh, scholars affiliated with uh, uh, academic uh, institutions can participate in Chinese uh, excavation in China. And in 1909, uh, nine, uh, in, in 2002, uh, revised the law of people, uh, of people of China, our protection of cultural, cultural relics. So this is the basic, um, basic um, structure the talk I want to talk the rise of national heritage uh, in, in modern China and uh, from 1909 um, the Qing government and also particularly 1930 this um, law on the protection culture culture uh, ancient ancient uh, relics um, it's a very it's it's a part of the international movement um, the international because of Western um, exploitation of archaeological heritage, I think starting from uh, Egypt, Egypt, Middle East, and China in East Asia is the end of that process. Some scholar called antiquity rush for, for Western, Western uh, museums and uh, universities uh, uh, competing to um, excavate in Egypt, in, in Near East, in Central Asia, and, and in China. And all these local, uh, local countries, local government, began to formulate um, legislations to protect the, their cultural heritage. And the Chinese, the Chinese process is part of that international uh, process. But there's uh, also a consequence for this, uh, um, many of the problems in this 1930 law, with, especially with the uh, economic uh, development in, in China. So uh, the following is, um, is, is I'll just uh, introduce some, some new current problems uh, of this law. Um, so I, I, my title is The Contradictions in Contemporary China, the Economic Development and the Market Value of Cultural Heritage. So with, uh, with the economic um, development in China, um, um, the, the flourish of, uh, of antique market within China and internationally. So Chinese archeological material was, um, was um, 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 severely damaged in the, in the recent uh, decades. So um, I came from um, um, Zhejiang province. So um, 
when I go back to China summer, sometime and tour the, uh, the, the nearby uh, uh, um, counties or you know, place, cities, see what kind of new archaeological things uh, were excavated. So uh, here is a, a, a Shaoxing Yue Culture Museum in Shaoxing, Zhejiang province. This is one of these uh, new phenomena in China now, private museum. And the museum was, I asked around, and the, and the museum was owned by, owned by a local collector. Um, and he turned out to be the uh, deputy director of the local security bureau in, in Shaoxing. Because according to the current Chinese law, everything underground or, or exposed to the surface belong to the nation. Except your family, your family um, uh, heirloom that from antiques that you, 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 you inherit from your, your ancestors. You cannot own any, ob uh, any uh, archaeological object because it's, uh, it's a belong to the nation. And in this uh, museum, everything in this museum is uh, it's newly um, excavated. So this is the contradiction of law. And there's another case. There's local, local collector who collect many of these similar, similar uh, um, uh, antiques. Mm -hmm. And he want to, I think probably he also heard, heard um, you know, the police is looking for him. And he want to donate his collection to the local museum. So is he a criminal? Should he be prosecuted? Or he is someone who, uh, who uh, find uh, antiques and want to donate to the government, and you should, um, sh should award him for his you know, nice deed. So this is the contradiction in Chinese uh, legal system right now. It's only, only a one, one small point. I think this is the aspect, in, because the 1930 law is too broad. Everything, everything underground exposed to, uh, in the surface, are belong to the nation. And anything have scientific value are belong to the, belong to the nation. So it's in many cases, this law cannot be um, uh, efficiently uh, enforced. So this is the contradiction in, in Chinese legal system uh, right now. How to work this out, um, no one really have, have a clear idea. And this is a, is a broad issue of the Chinese, the Chinese system uh, right now. So I want to also uh, bring up another issue about the, um, um, you know, in the beginning I said because of the, the uh, el elimination of the uh, education system, or the elimination of the civil examination system, so Confucianism no longer being, being, being um, state ideology uh, or, <coughs> the basis for in, 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 uh, uh, intellectual uh, ideology. So, you know, we know, all know uh, Lu Xun and Hu Shi, all these uh, main fourth intellectuals. Their, their attitude towards the Chinese tradition or the Confucianism are very negative, or, or you know, they use a scientific attitude to, um, to study. So you need to sort them out. Some are good, some are not good. So, this kind of attitude was dominant, the Chinese, um, I think, state ideology and intellectual uh, ideology in the, in the last century. A couple of years ago, there's a huge statue uh, of uh, Confucius was, was, is, was, was put up in front of the, the National Museum in Tiananmen Square. And you know, some people say it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, some some, some, someone's uh, own idea, like some group's own idea to put a Confucius statue in Tiananmen Square. But all you all know Tiananmen Square is, uh, is, is not a place you can do anything, <laughs> right? It's a 9.5 uh, meters high, 17 tons, it's, it's huge. So established on January 11th, uh, 2011, and then removed into the National Museum in the evening of April 20th, 1911, only 100 days. So there's a, a, a survey, uh, online survey. Uh, it's reported uh, uh, 200, uh, 220,000 um, 
or the netizen <laughs> uh, uh, participated in the survey, 75% uh, uh, of the netizens said, you know, it's, uh, they should, ha should not have the Confucius uh, statue on Tiananmen Square in front of the National uh, Museum. But uh, um, there also have people, 22% uh, of people, they, uh, you know, the, whether or not Confucianism um, is coming back as a state ideology. So our value, is the Chinese value system change again? So this is, I think, I have no answer. So the more close to study contemporary China and become more confused because there's no clear answer for, for, um, for um, you know, how to work out uh, um, this, this uh, um, um, system and how to protect uh, um, the Chinese cultural heritage. That's what I have uh, today. And I look forward to your comments and, and suggestions. Thank you very much.